back when Ajahn Mun was alive. And still today in Thailand. You have the phenomenon of scholarly monks saying of meditating monks, what can they know? They sit with their eyes closed. What can they see? Of course, the answer is they see their own minds. The scholarly monks would say, we spend years looking through the texts and we still don't fully understand them. How can you understand anything by sitting there with your eyes closed? And the answer is that the real problems in life don't lie in the books. Those are just the names of the problems. The real problems lie in the mind, which is why we sit here focusing on the breath as a way of bringing the mind in the present moment where we can watch it. We turn our gaze inward instead of looking outward. What do you see when you look outward? Well, you see aging, illness, and death. You see other people's issues. There are good points, there are bad points. You see the world around you, it's good points and bad points. But those aren't the things that make a real difference in your life. The real things that make a difference are your own decisions. the way you manage your own mind. This is why contentment is such an important principle in the practice. Contentment in terms of where you are, the situation in which you find yourself, in terms of the people, the physical comforts and discomforts. In terms of people, the important thing is finding a group what they call admirable friends. Or if you can find just one admirable friend, that's you've got a lot right there. That's important. As the Buddha said, you don't practice contentment so much with your friends if they're not people who live by the Dharma, who speak the Dharma. People who engage in lying and stealing and divisive speech, dividing other people against each other, abusive speech, idle chatter. You don't want to hang around with these people, as the Buddha said. If you, these are the kind of people you find, it's, and those are the only kind of people you can find, it's better to go alone. But once you found a good, admirable friend, a good community in which to practice, you should be willing to put up with a lot of hardships, he said. Think of the, again of the time of John Munn. He was way out there in the forest. Anyone who wanted to study with him had to go walking on foot, many times not really sure they were going to find him. because he kept on the move. By the time someone showed up to, to practice with him, he was sure that that person really wanted to practice with him, because they had to put up through a lot of hardships, not only to find him, but also when they had to stay with him. And John Fu once made a similar comment back in the very earliest days at Wat Damasat. It was very difficult to get there. The road from Bangkok to Rio took about all day. And it was not an easy ride. And then from Rayong it was quite a bit further out. Six kilometers of a muddy, potholed road. It was just a dirt road back in those days. And he said by the time someone came out to see him, having gone through all that, he was convinced that they were really serious about what he had to teach. And so he'd be happy to teach them. He said it was a lot better than in the days when he lived at Watasokram, right near Bangkok, anybody with time to kill would come out and try to kill his time, too. And who knew how serious they were, because it was so easy to get there. But the willingness to put up with hardships is an important part of the practice. In fact, it's not something you just grit your teeth and bear it. It's an essential part of the practice. There have got to be some hardships along the path. Because when things outside aren't going all that well, where are you going to focus your attention? Well, you could focus your attention outside and just get upset about it, but that doesn't accomplish anything. It makes you focus your attention more and more inwardly. If you're going to find happiness, you've got to find it inside. This is why the great Ajans were able to find the Dharma out in the forest. We tend to have a romantic idea of the forest. Peaceful, green, beautiful forest. Because our idea of forest life has become awfully sanitized. There are a lot of difficulties there. There are dangerous animals, and not just the tigers that seem kind of romantic. 
just the day-to-day -day thing, the bugs and the snakes and other animals that carry diseases. And yet when you're surrounded by things like this, and our normal tendency is to look for happiness in terms of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. But when they aren't all that pleasant, where do you have to turn? You have to turn within. And having the mind center, that becomes basically a life and death matter. If you can find that sense of well-being within, if you can stir up those resources of goodwill that you're going to need in order to live in the forest, in spite of the fact that things seem to be weighing in on you from all directions. That's where you really learn the strength of the Dharma, the importance of the Dharma. And it forces you to make your choices in terms of priorities. What's really important in your life? Physical comfort or the comfort of the Dharma? Pleasant people who do things the way you like or people who teach you the Dharma? People who exemplify the Dharma? The happiness is based on things outside or happiness that comes from within? And Difficulties on the outside really force the issue in a way that pleasant surroundings don't. And it's your realization of this, that, and you're willing to act on that realization. That's what really makes a Dharma practitioner out of you. When you finally decide you're not going to hold anything back, that this really is what's most important in life. And you're going to go at it without reservations. There's that image in the text of the elephant going into battle. He fights with his front feet, fights with his back feet, front quarters, back quarters, but he protects his trunk all the time. He wasn't willing to use that because the trunk, of course, is his most sensitive part. And the elephant trainer sees that and realizes, okay, this elephant really hasn't given himself to the king. And same way, when people balk at discomfort, it's a sign you really haven't given yourself to the practice. It's a willingness to put up with discomforts and that's a mark of a true Dharma practitioner, someone who really has what they call love for the Dharma, tamma, Dhamma Janda, desire for the Dharma, Dhamma Ratta, desire, love for the Dharma. And this is what makes all the difference in the practice. Because if you hold things back in the practice, it's going to hold things back in terms of the results you're going to get. We miss this because our minds keep flowing out. The Buddha talks about asavas, which can be translated as effluence giving both the sense that it's something that flows out and also something that's not especially clean. And yet the force of these drives, the force of this, these floods that come out of the mouth, come out of the mind, can drive us all over the place. Sensual desire, becoming, views, ignorance. These currents come out of the mind. We tend to ride with them so we don't really realize how strong they are, because we don't try to withstand them. And as a result, they can push you all over the place. It's when you decide you're going to turn around and look at them as the main problem. Because what they do is they point out, see that over there, and either that's something you want or that's something you hate. They distract your attention. You could say they're like politicians. The politicians do their dirty work and they say, see that other person over there? They're doing something horrible. Get you all excited about the other person so you don't notice what they're doing. This is the way the mind operates. These asavas keep flowing out, flowing out, pushing you in all kinds of directions. But it's only when you learn to turn around and look at them, to withstand them, to, the Buddha says, create an island where that flood does not overwhelm you. Even if it's not the ultimate island, you build a temporary island with concentration so that you're not pushed around all the time. That means taking a stance where you are. And sometimes to take a stance where you are requires making some sacrifices. But that's where you make your choice. Whether you want to make those sacrifices or want to just continue going with the flow. It seems easier because it's more habitual, but actually there's an awful lot of suffering going with that flow. You never know where it's going to push you. But even though it may seem more difficult to take that stance right here, right now, after a while, as you get used to it, you find that you wouldn't want to live any other way. You begin to see the force of the effluence. You begin to see how they push you around in all kinds of ways. And you see the suffering that comes as a result. That's when you realize that you made the right choice, not to continue the old ways, sloshing around the world, 
but actually making a stance, taking a stance, keeping that stance. So it requires a lot of powers of resistance. We usually use our resistance. We resist this outside thing. We resist outside that outside. We resist this person, that situation. What we've got to do is learn how to resist the push that comes from within that makes us want to focus on things outside, that distracts our attention from the real issues that are bubbling up in the mind. That's the other translation for us about is fermentation. These things come bubbling up, and who knows where they're going to take you if you give in to them. So you see, but as you begin to take your stance, you see the value of not following through with them. Then you see the value of contentment, that once you make that choice, that you're going to take your stance here as a person who loves the Dharma more than a person who loves comfort or whatever the defilements want to have to say. And you can learn how to maintain that stance. That's when you find the Dharma really shows what an excellent thing it is, what a worthwhile thing it is, why it's the sort of thing you can give your whole life to. And ultimately, the, the teaching asks nothing less than that, that you give yourself totally to the practice. But what it gives in return is more than worth it. The Buddha once said, if you could make a deal that someone would spear you with a hundred spears every day, three times a day, morning, noon, and night, for a hundred years, with the guarantee that at the end of the hundred years you would get an awakening. He said that'd be a wager worth taking, or a, a deal worth taking, because otherwise, think of all the endless sufferings that there are in this world. He said when you attained awakening as a result of that wager, you wouldn't even think that you had attained it with pain and suffering, but it came with joy. So when you run into hardships in daily life, compare that to the hundred, you know, 300 spears a day. Put things into perspective, and you find that that perspective helps keep you on course. <laughs>